So uh, in Prague, and uh, I work on molecular gas uh, in jellyfish galaxies, uh, which I'm going to talk you uh, tell, tell you something about uh, in a minute. And we use IRM and ALMA telescopes to do that. Um, so let me draw you a picture. Uh, we talked about clusters yesterday, so you heard some basics about it. So I'm just going to repeat it. Um, so you have to imagine a place of full of galaxies. There's hundreds or even thousands of galaxy members at one place. They are bound together by gravity. And the space between them is filled with hot and kind of dense gas. So you can imagine that it's kind of aggressive environment for all the newcomers. So if galaxy falls into the cluster, it's kind of pushed from the happy time on the main sequence down to the passive red end of their life. So uh, why does it happen? Uh, there are a number of processes that act on galaxies in clusters. There are, uh, of course, internal processes that are not cluster dependent, uh, such as AGN or star formation feedback. But there are also uh, external processes that are uh, caused by the presence of the galaxy in the cluster. So there will be, for example, tidal interaction uh, of galaxy-galaxy or the uh, gravitational interaction of uh, the galaxy with the cluster itself. And then there is hydrodynamical processes uh, stripping, which is, um, which is like uh, tearing out the gas out of the galaxy disk. And then there are some rare effects like inability to convert gas to stars, but that are not so pronounced. So uh, I'm going to skip that. So let's talk about hydrodynamical stripping uh, or specifically around pressure stripping. So this is a process that is caused by uh, the galaxy that is moving with a very high velocity of several hundreds kilometers per second through the cluster environment and uh, its interaction with the intra-cluster medium. This is the hot and dense gas that's surrounding it. Um, so here's the formula. You can see that the pressure is dependent on the density of the ICM and also the velocity of the falling galaxy. And as you, uh, as you heard yesterday, there's also a restoring force that's acting on the gas and uh, it tries to kind of drag it back to the uh, disk which would be the gravity of the galaxy. And um, so the pressure is only, uh, or the stripping is only effective if, the, if it exceeds the anchoring of the gas in the galaxy disk. Um, so you can see uh, in the picture on the right that, um, that the surface density of gas in the galaxy is dependent on the radius of the galaxy. So uh, the far, uh, the more far you are from the galaxy center, the less bound is the gas and it's more likely to be stripped. So um, this results in this outside in scenario in the uh, gas stripping because uh, on the edges that's where it's more, more loose and it proceeds to the center. So the typical stripping galaxy has this, this truncation, sharp edge of the uh, gas, which is uh, exactly the point where the stripping is still effective. And um, also it has one-sided, very prominent wake of gas. I'm going to show a picture just in a second, uh, which is uh, caused by the stripped gas that's uh, streaming out of the galaxy disk and form this beautiful show of multi-phase gas, uh, which uh, gives these galaxies the name jellyfish because it kind of looks like tentacles. And uh, most, not most important property, but very important property is uh, this stellar disk, which is intact. So let's have a picture here. Um, it's intact because stars are not uh, so easily stripped and the ramp pressure stripping cannot strip them out of uh, disks of galaxies. So you can see that the um, galaxy is perfectly fine in uh, invisible light. And then uh, if you just go to H alpha, you can see this beautiful stream of gas that's uh, stripped from the galaxy by the ramp pressure stripping. Um, okay, so we study these objects. Uh, first of all, I got uh, this data from IRM 30 meter. I got data for five galaxies in nearby coma cluster. Um, 
the idea was to uh, form the sample in such a way that uh, uh, each of the galaxy is di in different phase of its stripping evolution within the cluster. So as you can see in table below, we have three candidates that are in, let's say, early phase stripping estimated by H alpha properties. And then we have two in medium phase. Unfortunately, there was not enough time to also cover the late phase, but uh, we kind of um, made it up. Uh, sorry, we. Um, Mm, uh, so, so with Alma sample, sorry, uh, we uh, solved that issue. So we also have late phase candidates in the Alma sample that uh, I'm going to introduce in a minute. So uh, in picture on the right, you can see a coma cluster with amplified sample galaxies in blue circles that are that is my sample, and we have CO two to one and also CO one to zero observations for these objects, both in disk and the tails. So because, because it's not the main focus of this talk, uh, I don't want to spend too much time with the IRAM analysis, but I'm just going to show you quickly what we did. So um, here in the gray picture, you can see H alpha gas. Uh, you can see how it's clumpy uh, outside the disk. Those are H alpha clumps. And uh, we put there the beams of the IRAM telescope so we can uh, explore whether there's also uh, molecular gas um, besides the H alpha. And um, you can see uh, in the left and right CO120 and CO221 results, respectively. So you can see there are very nice detections, or, <laughs> you know, we are talking about radio, so they are very nice for me. And um, then we, of course, evaluated the amounts and other properties of this gas in the disk and outside of it. So one of the most interesting things that we kind of didn't expect is uh, this plot. I'm going to introduce it to you. There's on x-axis the stellar mass. On the y-axis, there's ratio of molecular gas and stellar mass. In gray, you can see the field galaxies from a cold gas reference sample. Uh, those are not cluster galaxies, so you can uh, expect them to kind of act naturally. Uh, and then there is this line that shows the mean of the distribution. And uh, my sample is in yellow and red. So why are there two points for each of my galaxies? That's because you might know that there's kind of a, a problem with converting the CO luminosity to the H2 mass or not problem. There's just debate about that. So um, we used both the uh, galactic value, uh, the standard one, which is in yellow and then in red, there's the metallicity dependent conversion factor uh, by Akurzo. So uh, you can see that there are some slight differences using the two methods. And the result is that for all of my galaxies, oh, sorry, there's also one more that's kind of unofficially in my sample because we have data for that, but it's not uh, involved in the original sample. So you can see that for all of those, uh, in, but one little that's almost entirely stripped, the molecular gas amount is much larger than uh, for field galaxies. So that was surprising, right? And we started to ask the question, where is the extra gas coming from? And the idea is that when you imagine the ram pressure acting from the front of the galaxy that's falling into the cluster, uh, it comp compresses the gas on the leading half of the galaxy. And this compression causes conversion from atomic to mo molecular gas. And the molecular gas then uh, fuels the star formation that would happen on the leading part of the galaxy uh, explicitly. So um, this idea was recently explored in paper by Roberts. 2022. And what he did is he took a low far data to estimate the tail direction uh, of the stripping. And then he used this direction to define a half of the galaxy, leading half and the trailing half. And he uh, evaluated the star formation rate in those respective parts. And the result of Roberts is that there is a uh, excess in both specific star formation and star formation rate in the leading half of the galaxies. That's again, the half that's facing the stripping, that's kind of the, interact, that's the interacting half. Uh, so I thought that I might do the same with our um, wonderful large uh, program, uh, Alma Jelly. Uh, I'm going to just briefly introduce it. It's a uh, um, 28 galaxy observation. They are in nearby clusters, Leo, Norma, and Coma. 
uh, we observe them in CO221. And the idea is, uh, so they're all in different stripping phases. And the idea is to study the incidence of molecular gas, both in disc and the tails. Also to study the star formation efficiency in tails and um, the exact process of mixing of the strip gas with the surrounding ICM, which is very interesting and not very well understood to this point. Um, so I thought that I can use this data to do some, something similar to what Roberts did. And I took the H alpha images of the galaxies that I have and defined the tail direction. Then uh, using the tail direction, I defined the half, the splitting line between the leading and trailing half. And then in the picture on the right, you can see how it translates to the ALMA data. So you can see the moment eight. Uh, I uh, intentionally put here moment eight because it shows very nicely the gas distribution. But what I actually worked with was moment zero because I wanted to compare the amounts of the gas, not just the maxima. And you can see that the moment zero is not so nice. So I helped uh, myself with this Tony Wong mask moment that you might know. It's a process how to make a mask of a specific significance that you as a user define. And uh, you are left with a very nice distribution um, and just the data above some certain limit. Uh, if you want details, I can give it to you uh, possibly in Slack, but uh, I don't want to spend too much time here explaining this routine, but it's very nice. And um, finally, I plugged this um, uh, moment zero from the Dwong mask moment routine to the DS9. And I uh, then uh, did the projected region and um, within the region. Uh, sorry to interrupt, you have three minutes. Perfect. So uh, in this projected region, I did the inter integrated flask profile. And you can see, so in the yellow box, there's always the leading part the blue box will be always a trailing half. And you can see that the gas, the amount of gas in the leading half exceeds the amount in the trailing half. So I'm going to go through the sample because it's kind of repeating itself. So here it's even more pronounced, wonderful excess in the leading half, again, uh, for another galaxy. And now here's where the trouble began. So for galaxy uh, 3071 that you might remember, it was the poor one that was not above the line in uh, my excess picture. Uh, that's almost completely stripped. So there was no way how to do this analysis. And then there is another one. And as you can see, uh, using the same method, it doesn't work at all. You can see that the amount of gas in the trailing half is much, much higher than in the trailing half. Uh, in the leading, sorry, leading half. But what happens if you move a center, defined center, just a little bit? Well, now it works. So the problem is that when you uh, take the, sorry, I didn't mention it before, the center was taken from the SDSS visible image and it worked fine for almost all galaxies. But you can see that when you plot uh, moment one, so you can see the rotation of the galaxy and you put center to the of the galaxy to the center of the rotation. You can see that the SDSS center is shifted uh, from that significantly. So this will be a drop, like, let's say, um, problem or potential problem with this analysis to perfectly define the center. So this doesn't happen. So you can see again that the interpretation is very different. So we really need to be careful about that. So my take home points is that um, first we discovered excess in molecular gas in um, ram pressure stripping galaxies. And then we, when we kind of looked for uh, the origin of this excess, we find that uh, on the leading half of the stripping galaxies, there is more gas than in the trailing half. That could mean that the ram pressure stripping process itself ignites this conversion to uh, from atoms to molecules. So that's all. I'm happy to take questions. Thank you.